And good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today, we're doing a little bit of all three, which is really exciting. So thank you guys so much for joining us in our crazy October with over 60 sessions on a huge variety of topics. So thanks for being a part. Right now, we've got six classes joining us from across North America. So I want to give them a chance to say hi. We've got... Miss McNeil's grade two threes in Lethbridge, Alberta. Hi guys. <laughs> awesome, welcome in. We've got Miss Teeson's grade threes in Surrey in BC. Hi guys. Hi. Hey. We've got Miss Demianakos' grade threes in Nepean, Ontario. Hi guys. <laughs> Oh, they're, they're breaking the record of enthusiasm so far. Okay. We've got Miss Evans, grade fours in Rapid City, South Dakota. Hi, guys. Oh, the, the U.S. is making a stand um, for defeating Canada. All right. It's an it's a international excitement challenge. We've got Miss Rockcliffe's grade fours in St. Albert, Alberta. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got, we've got physical aspects into the excitement now, and then we've got a bunch of classes from Prescott Learning Center in uh, Spruce Grove, Alberta, grade fours, uh, which Carolyn's really happy about, we'll find out why in a minute, so, uh, hey guys, welcome in. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speakers. We are joined live by Carolyn Heaton, uh, and she is at Banff National Park. She's going to explore a little bit about the conservation and action there and the bison, bringing bison back to Banff National Park. So it's an incredible story. We shared it once before on our platform. We're so excited to have her back. And so without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Carolyn, and take it away. Am I on now? Can you hear me? Oh, now you're good. Yay! Oh my gosh, what an exciting welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy you're here. Way to, way to bring it this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, well, first of all, my name is Caroline Hayden. I work here with Parks Canada as a conservation educator in Banff National Park. And I'm so happy that you guys could all be here today because we are gonna be talking about something very special. We're going behind the scenes to talk about something big and bold that's happening right here in Banff National Park. We are reintroducing North America's largest land mammal to Canada's first national park. Basically, that means that we're bringing bison back to Banff. Now put your hands up if you know what a bison is. Are you kidding? That's amazing. Everybody knows what a bison is. <laughs> well, uh, for those of you who need a refresher, these are three bison in front of you. They're also called buffalo. You can use the same name for both of them. Uh oh, I'm getting a phone call. Uh, you can use the same name for both of them. Um, and as I mentioned, they're North America's largest animal, land mammal. They're huge, they're strong, they evolved during the Ice Age, and they're personally my favorite animal in the whole world. And it also happens that they're not the easiest thing to reintroduce. So today we're going to go behind the scenes and break down the five steps that it takes to bring bison back to Banff after they were missing from the landscape for about 150 years. It's super exciting and you're gonna see all of the moving parts that make it possible. But first of all, uh, we need to acknowledge that Banff National Park is on the traditional territories of the Treaty 6, 7, and 8 nations along with the Métis Nation of Alberta. For thousands of years, Indigenous people have traveled through these valleys for sustenance and for ceremony, and we thank them for their stewardship of this beautiful landscape and for sharing the land for, with us. And this is where our landscape is. Wait for the map to pop up here. 
So, especially for those of you who are from the States, welcome, thank you for joining us. This is a map of Canada. That's where we are right there in Banff National Park. And this map also shows all of the national parks from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. So it all started right here in Banff. We're the very first national park. We were founded in 1885, which is a really long time ago. And since then, you've grown into a network of protected places. And here in Parks Canada, we have a special job. And that job is to make sure that some of most Canada's most special and unique places are protected and healthy and whole. And what that means is that we have uh, uh, scientists in every single one of our parks and they have a very important job to do. Their job is to monitor the health of our ecosystems, see how things are working. And sometimes that means reintroducing things that are missing. And here in Banff, we were missing something very important. We were missing a keystone species, bison. So sometimes making sure our landscapes are healthy and whole means that we bring back these missing pieces. But not only are we stewards of the land here in Parks Canada, we're also storytellers. So we want to make sure that these places are healthy and whole so that Canadians and visitors like from like our friends from the States can come to these places, whether it's Banff or any other of our national parks to spend time with your family, to go on a hike, to see the sunrise and see what makes Canada so special. And if you have visit us, visited us here uh, in Banff, this might be a familiar sight. So we are located in the heart of the Rocky Mountains uh, and we protect a landscape that looks kind of like this. So rugged mountains, glaciers, beautiful alpine lakes. And when people think of Canada, a lot of times they're thinking of a landscape that looks just like this. We also protect several really important species. So we protect, uh, for example, the Rocky Mountain sheep. Along with two species of bears, not one, but two. We have both the black bear and we also have the grizzly bear. Isn't that a cool picture? Super cool, what a beautiful bear. I don't know. And up until recently, uh, this landscape was also home to bison or buffalo. So unfortunately, they disappeared before the park was even created. But we know that they were here from some of the clues that they've left behind. Uh, so we've had to look to uh, pieces from the past to tell us about how bison use this landscape. So we've looked at explorers journals, uh, indigenous oral history, and pretty cool, we'd also use archeology. span So we're gonna pop over to our other camera so I can show you something cool that we found. Perfect. Did that pop up yet? Yep, you got Great. the one. Perfect. Um, so this is uh, a bison bone, and as you can see, it's pretty big. So I actually found this bone just outside of Banff, or in the town of Banff a couple years ago, and I looked down and knew right away that it was a bison bone. It's, first of all, so giant, so just for scale, you can see how big this thing is. And it also looked really old. So we'll just zoom in here so you can get a better look. So 
So as you can see here, we have this kind of golden coloring. And you can't feel it, but um, it feels a, a bit more like a stone than it does a bone. So what we did is uh, we brought this back to our team of archaeologists. And uh, the first thing they did was they actually took a sample. So they cut a piece out of this bone and uh, they powdered it up. And then they sent it away to get some extra testing. So they did some DNA testing to make sure this was really a bison bone. And they also did some carbon dating. And that will tell us how old this bone might be. So we sent it all away and we were really excited uh, and we got the data back. And it turns out that this is indeed a bison bone and it is over 2000 years old, this very bone. So this is a little piece of history that tells us about the complex way that bison traveled the valleys of what is now Banff National Park. So let's pop back over here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. We're good. Got it? Yep. Great. Uh, so not only did bison travel in Banff National Park, but they actually had a huge territory. So this map here shows you the traditional uh, range of the two subspecies of bison. So we have the wood bison in the orange and the plains bison in the dark brown. We're only gonna be talking about the plains bison today. And that's what we think of when we think of as the um, buffalo of the wild west. Their territory was huge. So all the way up to Edmonton, all the way down to Mexico, out to Florida. And uh, we're right here, at, here in Banff at the western edge of their tr traditional range. Now it's, it's hard to imagine, but North America used to look a lot different. So 200 years ago, say you were in what is now Calgary, you could have looked out your window and maybe seen a site like this. Bison, as far as the eye could see, you could hear their footprints shaking the ground, you could smell them in the air. Now this might be a bit of an exaggeration, but at their height, uh, the best estimate we have is about 30 million bison across North America. So that's about the amount of people that live in Canada. And even harder to imagine is that bison nearly went extinct. So in a single human lifetime, we went from 30 million bison to less than a thousand individual bison. And this photo really says it all. So just take a couple seconds just to uh, look closely at this image and imagine how many bison, so this is all bison skulls, just imagine how many bison are in this pile of bones. So due to habitat loss and overhunting, we very nearly lost bison completely, but thankfully we didn't. And for over a century, uh, Parks Canada has been helping to give bison a second chance. And part of that work means reintroducing bison to parts of their traditional range. So that means Banff. So we started a project to bring bison back to Banff. It's not easy, but this is uh, some of the reasons why it's so important. So first of all, um, ecology. So bison are keystone species. So that means that they benefit hundreds of other species around them. They help increase biodiversity and they also help increase the number of habitats in the ecosystem. So they help out bugs and bears and birds. Then as I mentioned, we are stewards here of the land, but we're also storytellers. So it's important for us to have uh, a story like this that is so full of hope uh, to bring to kids like you across North America uh, to inspire you guys to be stewards uh, in your own communities. Culture, uh, Indigenous people and bison have coexisted for thousands of years, so connecting people and bison was really important to us. History, we already talked about, 
bison belong here. They have roamed this landscape for 10,000 years. And lastly, uh, bringing bison back to Banff is one step of Parks Canada's vision to give bison a brighter future. And this is what it looks like here. So the last wild bison was seen in Banff in the 1870s. And then in 2017, so just a couple of years ago, we started uh, a project to see if it's possible to return wild bison to Banff. So it's a five-year tester project. Uh, and by the end of our project in 2022, we might have 100 bison in our herd. And we'll press pause, we'll look at all of our data, and we'll see if it makes sense to protect bison over the long term. And I'll show you what that looks like. So it all starts with step one. Uh, and that step was to get bison from Elk Island National Park, which is another national park just outside of Edmonton. So Elk Island Park uh, protects the seed herd for conservation bison in Canada. Uh, so we got a small herd of 16 animals from them. And before we brought them to Banff, we actually gave them some pretty special jewelry. So we're gonna pop back over to our camera so I can show you what that looks like. And you're golden. Perfect. Great. Okay, so this is a bison horn. So it's different than an antler that you'll see on an elk or a deer, which grow and lose their antlers every year. This bison will keep their horns for their whole life. Now their horns are really special because they're made out of the same thing that our fingernails are made out of. And when it's on a living bison, this a uh, horn shield will cover the living bone in on the bison's skull. So bison will keep it for their whole for their whole lives. And as you can see, we'll just take a closer look here. Bison will grow a new layer every year. So this can also be a really helpful way to get an idea of how old a bison might be. Pretty cool. Feels kind of like a cheese grater. Now, if we go to the other side here you'll see that the end of the horn is pretty pokey. And sometimes even when they don't mean to, bison can accidentally poke each other. And we wanted to make sure that all of our bison arrived safe and sound. So what we did is we used some state-of-the-art conservation technology, duct tape. Uh, we had, before, while we were doing some disease testing to make sure our bison were healthy, we actually took uh, some essentially garden hose and we duct taped it to the end of their horn, just like this. This is actually a, a tube that we used as part of our project so that when bison bumped into each other, instead of a sharp horn, they got a squishy tube, uh, which ended up working super well, very low tech, but all of our bison arrived safe and sound. So after we um, gave our bison their special jewelry, uh, we actually loaded them up into these special containers you can see on the back of these trucks. They're all full of bison. Uh, and we basically, we had this uh, fleet of bison trucks and we started about a seven hour road trip that took us from Elk Island all the way down to the border of Banff National Park. It's not so often you get to go on a road trip with a whole herd of bison. And once we arrived there, we had a challenge because where we're bringing the bison, there was no road access. So a helicopter came and plucked each of the containers off of the back of the trucks and flew the bison in the air over the mountain. It was super cool. We had a, a GoPro mounted in the containers to make sure the bison were happy. And as you can see from our footage, they were so relaxed, so calm, no big deal. Um, 
but I'm sure it was still a weird experience for them because it's not every day that bison get to fly over the mountains. And here you can see the horn tubes in action. Uh, so when uh, all of the boxes arrived on site, uh, we carefully opened all of the doors of those containers and the bison took the very first steps that bison have taken in Banff National Park in 150 years. A very cool day for conservation. And then that brought us to step two, uh, which was to care for the herd. So what we did is kind of the training wheels version of a reintroduction. So we held the bison in a fenced pasture to allow them to get used to living in the mountains because they had a lot to learn. Uh, so this is the pasture that we kept them in. And for a year and a half, our staff had the coolest job in the whole world. Um, their job was to monitor the herd, um, make sure that they were happy and healthy, and they actually got to know them as individual bison, which is pretty neat. And during that time, uh, the cows of the herd gave birth to 20 baby calves, and they're the cutest things in the whole world. Uh, they come out bright orange, they're so curious, and pretty much right away, they're up and keeping up with their mom. And while they were in this pasture, they had some things to learn about living in the mountains. So they had never seen a river before. So they had to learn how to cross the river, how to drink from the river, um, but they figured it out in no time. So in this picture, that's one of the very first times that wild bison have crossed a river on this landscape in a very long time. And they also had to gain some mountain muscle. So in this picture, that is a one day old calf keeping up with its mom, no problem. And lastly, before we release them, we gave all the adults really cool GPS collars so we could track their movements over the landscape. I'll show you what that looks like in just a little bit. And then that brought us to the third step the big day, which was to release the bison into the wild. So this happened uh, last summer. I got to be part of it. And uh, it was so cool to be there in that moment where we cut the fence open to give the herd their freedom. Now we were so excited, our stomach was full of butterflies and we stood back and we waited. The bison were taking a nap, we waited. We just thought that they would smell the opening and, and, uh, and leave the enclosure. But time passed and we waited and we waited. Eventually we had to go to bed because it was nighttime. But sure enough, in the middle of the night, the herd all left the pasture and out into the wild, like a jail, midnight jailbreak. And this is the landscape that they emerged into, one of the most remote, rugged places in Banff National Park where you're more likely to see a wolf than you are another human being. So we went out there the next, mo the next morning to try to find where they went. So we scanned the valleys, couldn't see them. And then we started looking up, way up, and we found bison underneath that red circle. Isn't that crazy? So that's two cows and they're two two day old calves. Totally blew our minds. And they stayed on that ridge for about two weeks, just eating the tiniest little bits of grass. So now I'm gonna need a classroom volunteer for our next slide. Jesse, can you help me out? I sure can. All right, so Ms. McNeil's class, we'll go to you guys. Uh, do you want them unmuted now or do you want to ask a question first? I'm gonna ask the question. So I just need one volunteer okay. uh, to, to play hot and cold with me and point out where the bison are hidden on this picture. Does right, everyone so see my mouse here? Yeah, we can see your mouse okay, so Ms. Perfect. McNeil's class. Whoever wants to play along, go for it, okay. Go right ahead, Carolyn. Okay, tell me if I'm getting hotter or colder. 
What do you guys think? Closer to the bison or further away? Further, further. Further? You think they're, they're over here? Closer. 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 Oh, this it... way? <laughs> Higher? Oh. Yeah. Oh. oh, am I getting closer? Yeah, hotter. 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 Oh. Hotter. How hot am I? Burning hot. Very hot. Ah! Perfect. Okay. Nice work. <laughs> you found them. So they're not rocks. That's really a herd of bison on a mountain face. Pretty unbelievable. And so now they've been in the wild for a year. And every single day we come to the office and it feels like we are discovering a new species. They're spending most of their time in habitat. We never dreamed that they would be traveling. So this is the herd up on a high mountain pass. And what we're seeing kind of two summers in here is that as soon as the snow melts, they are getting as high up on the mountain as they possibly can and staying there all summer long until the snow pushes them down again. Kind of like in the same habitat that you would find mountain goats, pretty wild. So they made it through their first winter um, without any help from us. And they're getting ready for their second winter here. And we're just so impressed by them. Like this is a photo that was taken just a few weeks ago. And you can just see how healthy they are. Their coats are gleaming. Uh, they're, uh, they had two new calves and they're finding the lands, the meadows and using this, this um, backcountry area in the same way that their ancestors might have for thousands of years. Which brings us to step number four, which is the step that we are in right now, learning from the herd. So for the first um, half of this project, we were really guiding the bison as they learned to explore their new home range. And now the relationships flipped. So every single day we're learning something new from them. So we send uh, our team out every couple of weeks or so on horses or on foot or on skis to see the, the animals on the, in their ecosystem, in their new home. So a major tool that we use to find them is telemetry. So remember those uh, GPS collars? So as you remember, we gave each of our bison um, a radio collar. And these are really special collars because each one gives off a unique signal, which is kind of like the bison's own radio station. They're all unique to each other. So what we can do is we can go to, into the field with what's called a telemetry receiver. And that will pick up the different radio stations of the bison. And using that, we can um, see where it's coming from, where it's loudest, and get an idea of where the bison might be. So then once we have that better idea, we can get as close as we need to uh, to get the, the observation data that we are looking for, which is like how healthy they are, um, what their behaviors are like, and over time, that will give us an idea of how the herd is adapting to their new home. Did the video finish for everybody? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. So we can use that in the field, but we can also log on to our computers and we can see the GPS uploads of where the herd has been. So I know this uh, video is a little choppy because there's just so much information. Um, but what you're seeing here is the GPS data from six months of a bison from, their, from the time that they were released. So what's really neat about this is we can see the exact areas that the bison are traveling through and spending time. Now, as time passes, we'll be able to layer that data and get a better understanding of how the bison are traveling this place. And we can ask questions like, where do bison go in different seasons? Which bison is leading the herd? And how do bison interact with other wildlife on, on the landscape? Um, so, because we also have other animals that are collared, like several wolves, 
uh, so we can see over time how they're interacting. Pretty neat. And what are data showing us so far, uh, that's uh, where we want the bison to adopt as their new home range, is that they're spending time in that northern section of their, um, their protected area. So over the next uh, few years of the project, we're hoping that they'll travel south and really experience that full light green area that they have access to. Oh, I actually got a chance to go into one of these valleys where the bison have been grazing and spending time and there weren't any bison there at the time, but I walked into this meadow and it just hit me in the face. You could, they have this deep earthy smell. I looked down, you could see all these bison patties that you can see in this photo. There was new fresh grass coming up from the bison grazing. There were ground squirrels chirping, there was fur left on the trees. And it just felt that there was this beautiful dance that was happening out there. An old dance that had been happening for uh, hundreds and thousands of years and had been quiet for so long. And it was incredible to see this richness that bison can bring back to this place happening right before my eyes. And best of all, it was so cool to look down on a trail and be walking on the footsteps of a bison and basically seeing the impossible happening right in front of you. Because bison had been gone for so long and to actually see them, like a sign of them right there um, under your foot is such a rewarding thing because we really are reintroducing bison to a place where they belong. Which brings us to our last step, step number five, uh, which is your step, which is to follow the herd. So our bison are on an exciting journey. We want you guys to be part of it. So we have a few ways that you can learn more. This past year, we actually sent our scientists out into the field with a camera to record the day-to-day -day of living with the herd. And from that, we made a five-part web series. It's all on our YouTube channel. We'll send you links to all this and we'll also link it below. Just, we'll talk about that after. Um, so our challenge to you is as a class, watch all of the series, each episode is about five minutes long, and choose your favorite episode and tell us why. And you can share it on social media. You can tag us at BAMPNP, use the hashtag Banff Bison, and we'll get back to you um, with a story from one of our scientists that were featured in the web series about one of their favorite moments out there with the bison. And part B, uh, as weather permits, fingers crossed, uh, we have another session here with Explorer. Where we're actually gonna take what we've just learned here in the classroom out into the field. So that's happening on October 23rd. Um, uh, sign up or stream it, because um, you'll be able to see what that data collection actually looks like out in the field. And for now, uh, let's do some questions. Outstanding, Carolyn. So yeah, not only will I share that link, so you'll get that in the email when we're done to all our classes watching on YouTube as well. And speaking of them, we've got tons of groups watching on YouTube. So if you guys want to just tell me where you're from, what grade you guys are in, type in a question in the chat bar and I'll pass it along to Carolyn. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for that. And let's dive in with questions. So first, we're going to go to Ms. Thiessen's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. Okay, come on and up and ask your question. Come up here. Okay. But they're asking you to. Yeah. We're coming. Take your time. No rush. <laughs> You're going to look in there. Say hi, I'm Carter. Hi, I'm Carter. Hi, Carter. My question was, how are bison ecosystems engineers? Wow. Are you kidding me? That <laughs> is amazing. Hi, virtual high five, dude. So <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, so... Bison are what we call keystone species. We can also use the term ecological engineer. So basically that means through their natural behaviors, bison help shape the ecosystem around them and also benefit hundreds of other species that also call that ecosystem home. So for bison, they benefit uh, their uh, ecosystem in so many different ways. Um, for example, um, 
in the winter time, bison will grow uh, a big fur coat. And um, in the springtime, they'll shed all of this beautiful wool and it falls out in these big clumps. And birds will actually come and take that fur and use it to line their nests, which then uh, helps to ensure that more baby birds grow up to be big birds. Um, and that can help support bird populations over the long term. Uh, bison will also uh, increase meadow habitat. So I also, we also like to call them meadow makers. Bison are grazers, so they depend on grass. They eat a lot of grass every single day. Um, so they actually help push out forests who are trying to grow into uh, meadow spaces. So by using their horns and thrashing on the trees, by eating little um, tree shoots coming up, and by pushing over trees, by take, scratching on them, they actually push back forests uh, and help increase more uh, meadow spaces. And that helps benefit other species that depend on grassland, like birds that um, have their nests in open areas and other grazers like elk, for example. Uh, so we're already starting to see some of those changes play out here in Banff, which is very exciting. Very cool. All right. So great, great, great response. A great question. <laughs> great response too, Carol. <laughs> you got yourself in the back. Um, all right. Uh, Ms. Damianakos is positive. If you guys have a question, come on up. Hey, yeah, you're good to go. Yeah, we're coming. Okay, you move so she can get in there. Uh, there we go. Do bison have good eyesight? That's a really good question. So bison have different eyesight than we do. So we have predator eyes. So our eyes are right on the front of our head, like another, like an animal, like a coyote or a wolf. So our we really rely on vision. Uh, whereas bison have prey eyes. So their eyes are actually on the side of their head. And so they see differently than we do. And what they're really good at is seeing movement. So they might not see in the same way that we do, but they're really good at perceiving movement off in the distance because they're going to be watching for a predator creeping through the grass. Um, so their eyes are really tuned into that. Um, but they also have an incredible sense of smell. So they're relying on the wind carrying smells of potentially a predator or fresh grass uh, in the next meadow. Um, so their their eyesight like isn't as good maybe as we would interpret it, but taken together uh, with their sense of smell, um, they are so attuned to what is happening in the environment around them. Very cool, great question. All right, uh, Ms. Hansen's class joining us from Barrie, Ontario. I wanted to ask, what do bison eat, Carolyn? What do bison eat? Well, the bison are grazers. So bison eat a lot of grass. They're eating all day long. Uh, they're also called ruminants. So they have um, a stomach that has multiple chambers, kind of like a cow. If you've heard a cow has four stomachs. Uh, so bison will go out and they spend most of the day grazing. They don't like all day, all night, 24 hours a day. They'll take naps here and there. They're grazing all the time. And uh, we're actually looking at what bison are eating here in Banff. And we're doing like a, a big before after picture. So we use some really high tech drone technology that goes down to the tiny blade of grass uh, so that we can compare uh, after a few years of bison, having bison here of what types of foods that they were eating. Uh, but most of all, that's grass, that's little flowers. They love fireweed, the flower, if you know what that one is. It's bright and pink, um, beautiful. Um, they'll eat little shrubs. They'll eat little tree branches. But for the most part, it's a lot of grass. Outstanding. All right. Uh, Ms. Evans' class, or our lone US class. Come on up, guys. Uh, how do you make sure boundaries. Great question. You guys are pretty much all scientists. You're all <laughs> hired. Uh, <laughs> um, so as you saw on our map, we have a specific area where we want the herd uh, to spend their time, at least during our tester project. 
so it's a huge area. It's about the size of Calgary for those of you who are living in Canada. Um, and our challenge is to make sure they stay within that green zone so we can really understand what their needs are and how far they travel and how they can reintegrate back into um, the ecosystem around them. So what we use is a combination of things. So one, um, by keeping them in the pasture, we help to anchor them um, to that place so they start to adopt it as their home range. Uh, we also did a lot of prescribed burning. Uh, so prescribed fire is a really important component of a healthy landscape. So before we released the bison, we actually did a bunch of prescribed burning in key areas. And what that does is it helps new fresh grass uh, come up in the springtime. And bison love post burned areas. Sometimes even when it's still smoking uh, in a fired fire area, uh, bison will come in and start rooting around for fresh grass. It's pretty incredible. Uh, so that was a big tool in basically increasing habitat. Um, and then we also use short stretches of fencing. Not the whole area is not fenced. We have about 10 kilometers of fencing in total at key areas at the bottom of valleys. And so what that does is bison will come along and they just bounce the fence. And the hope is that they uh, get redirected back into the heart of their home range, uh, but it's designed to allow pretty much every other species from wolves to sheep to move back and forth easily. It just turns out bison are really big and they don't jump that well uh, and they can't go under that well. So it's uh, easier to keep them in um, while also allowing other species to move freely. So great question. Marvelous guys. All right, so what I'm going to do is alternate between live classes and YouTube. We've got enough time for about six more questions, guys. This has been a great long session. So Miss Jansen's group, Burlington, Ontario, wants to know, uh, have you done this with other animals as well? Is there anything else you've been reintroducing into BAMP or changing the habitat up? Uh, to BAMP, I mean, for Parks Canada has done a number of reintroductions across the country. Um, it's part of our efforts to restore uh, the ecological integrity of these places. Uh, so for example, uh, we were working to reintroduce black-footed ferrets in Grasslands National Park. Um, what else have we reintroduced? I think there's blanding turtles out on the East Coast. Um, and it just depends on what ecosystem that you're working with of what is, what is a missing component. Um, and here in BAM, something that was missing here was prescribed fire. So that is something that we brought back here um, a few decades ago to help make sure our, our ecosystems were healthy. Uh, so we're constantly learning, adapting, and bringing missing pieces back uh, as we notice they're gone uh, or that we're, it, the time is right to bring them back. Outstanding, great question, guys. All right, uh, Ms. Rockliffe's class, if you guys wanna come up. Come on. Yep, cool. yep. Right here. Sam, come right here. Right here. Come. Ask your question. <laughs> yes, Hi. Sure. Um, my question is, how many bison are usually in a herd? That's a great question. It varies. So bison can travel in just on their own. So often you'll see, even in our herd, um, adult bulls just traveling on their own, moving from place to place. Um, Small family groups will stay together. So kind of like elephants where you'll have um, the, all the cows, so the moms and their babies and all of the, the younger animals will stick together. Uh, and we're kind of, in our project here, we're learning on what that's gonna look like. So right now uh, they tend to all travel together. Um, but back in the day when there were so many bison, I mean, you'd have herds of 100,000 bison, like way more than we could count. Um, so we're definitely not gonna see that here in Banff. Um, but I think it just, it just varies on what your landscape looks like. Here in Banff, we're looking at smaller groups traveling together, um, but that could look different in another national park, like Grasslands National Park, where they have um, more bison than we do. Uh, so that's something we're definitely gonna be observing over the coming years. Very cool. So I was going to go to YouTube, but there's been a girl waiting so patiently in Spruce Grove with Mr. Shoemaker's group. So if you want to come up, uh, go for it. Um, why do bison go to the top of the mountain? Ah. That's a great question. Again, um, 
you know what? We don't know for sure. Uh, we definitely, we have found archeological evidence of bison up at high mountain passes. Um, so we know that historically they were also doing this, even though it is totally mind blowing to see bison in an unexpected place. Um, but there's a few reasons why they might be using that high habitat. One, bugs. There's so many bugs in the summer. So if you've ever been hiking, sometimes when you go higher out of the deep forest in the valley, there's more wind and it's harder for bugs to find you and get at you. So bugs could be a, a part of that. And um, they, they're also really finding like beautiful little patches of vegetation. So maybe there's delicious little bits of food up there. Um, and then they might also be able to get a higher vantage point to see where they are because it's a new place for them too. Uh, so just getting a better look and maybe they could see predators coming and maybe they just want to enjoy the sunset. You know, we will never quite know for sure, but it's definitely something that we're, we, we are observing in our herd here. Very cool. All right, we're going to take a few questions from YouTube and then we'll wrap up with last one from Ms. McNeil's group. Uh, so Mr. Bresden's group, uh, grade threes in Fulton Vale, Sherwood Park, Alberta, wanted to ask, how did you decide which bison to take from Elk Island? Oh, wow, you guys, you must have done a lot of research before this presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we actually put a lot of thought into the bison that we got from Elk Island. So we made sure we did some disease testing to make sure that they were all healthy, which they were. Um, and then we picked, we did some DNA testing. So we picked the bison that were least related to each other or had the most unique looking DNA. And lastly, we picked young animals. So all the animals that we brought were two years old or three years old um, because older animals tend to really uh, be honed into the, to their home and they have a tendency to want to go back to where they came from. Whereas younger animals are a bit more open to travel and change. Um, and the 10 cows that we brought were all pregnant. Um, so that we got a new burst of calves right in the spring when we brought, when we brought them back. So those are the, uh, some of the reasons why we chose the animals that we did. And we picked, well, they are all are thriving and, and doing well out there. Very cool. All right. Uh, Ms. Brown's group, uh, grade four is in Brampton, wanted to ask how many babies do bison have at a time? Bison have one baby at a time. Um, and they come out pretty big and within 10 minutes they're standing, within an hour they're running. Sometimes I've heard of up to four calves being born, but that's more like on a bison farm. But in the wild, you're really just seeing one, maybe on a very rare time you'll have twins. But for the most time, they really just um, focus on that one little baby. All right. And then Mr. Elsa's group in, in Burlington, Ontario, asked a whole whack of questions in a few seconds. So actually, that's a good question for you. Is there a place where classes can ask more questions? Because we're going to have way more than we can possibly take. Where can they get in touch to ask more? Okay. I'm actually just going to flip back to my slide here, and I can show you where you can learn more. Bring it up. So there's a few ways where you can follow the herd. I know this presentation is too short to get it all in here. Um. We are really active on our virtual storytelling platform. So you can follow us at Banff and P on Facebook and Twitter. We are always posting new photos, new stories. Um, on our Park Canada YouTube channel, uh, we have so many videos that take you behind the scenes, including uh, that web series that we put up this summer. And lastly, we have a bison blog. So it's a blog from our field. We put it out every month or so. We just launched a new uh, post last week. So you can read that as a class. And my contact information is also on there. If you have burning bison questions that you need answered, uh, that's the place to find us. Outstanding, perfect. Well, on that note, with that left on the screen for a second, uh, the question from Mr. Elsa's class, uh, their first one was, do uh, bison fight? And do they hurt each other in those sort of fights? Absolutely. Um, so bison fight for a number of different reasons. So in their rutting season, which is what we call their mating season, which just wrapped up here. So if that happens in July through September, um, you'll see adult bison fighting. So if you could ever go to a place where you can see bison uh, more accessibly, because our bison are really out there, 
Um, but stay in a place like Yellowstone or Grasslands National Park or Elk Island National Park, where you can really experience it um, close hand. It is a sight to behold. You'll see bulls uh, sparring with each other, running at what seems to be like 100 kilometers an hour uh, to lock horns. They can flip each other over. They're just so strong and the, they'll be big dust clouds and they make a sound that's like a, a lion's roar, like a <laughs> It is the most insane thing. It's really, really neat. Um, and then females will fight predators. So if an, um, if a wolf is coming and threatening their young, um, cows will fight back and use their horns, use their uh, hooves to keep their young and the herd safe. Uh, but for the most part, um, they're very peaceful animals. They're just trying to get their grass for the day and trying not to get eaten by wolves. Marvelous. And thank you so much for that unexpected lion roar. Uh, that is the best <laughs> part of the presentation. Um, I also, I'll share along a, a bison fight video with all the classes too, because it really is something to behold. It's one of the most amazing things in nature. All right, we're gonna wrap up with one last question from Ms. McNeil's class. So come on up guys, thanks for your patience and uh, end us off. You're good to go, yeah. We have two questions really quickly, two little Perfect. ones. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. So she wants to know how long the bison live for. Okay. Uh, so it depends. Uh, in the wild, bison might live up to 20 years, which is quite a long time because once they become an adult, they're pretty indestructible. They are the largest land mammal in North America, uh, and they're not easy for anything to hunt. So once they become an adult, they have a really good chance of living for a long time. And then in captivity, uh, they can live up to 30 years. So with the, a little extra uh, care from humans, giving them food and keeping them safe for predators, they can actually live a really long time. Cool. What's the second question, guys? Um, can you tell the difference between female and male buffalo? Absolutely. Um, I wish I had some pictures to show you. You can definitely find them on our blog. Um, they, if you see them both together, it's really obvious. So when you have adult bison, um, the males can weigh a ton, a thousand pounds. They're huge, they have big horns, um, they're very muscular, whereas the females are like 20% smaller. They have more, they both have horns, but their horns are a bit more slender. Um, and when they have a it's easiest to tell, especially in the spring season, because they'll often have a baby with them nursing. Um, and uh, yeah, once they're side by side, the, the adults, the bulls are just so much bigger. Uh, so it's mostly in size that you'll see that obvious difference. Very cool. All right, I know we could go all day guys with questions and you guys have been fantastic, but what we'll do is we'll wrap up there and then you can check out all those great resources Carolyn passed along to look up and can find more. Uh, so guys, what we do at the end of every session, I'm going to demute everyone's mic in a minute. And so boys and girls, if you guys could get ready to say a huge thank you to Carolyn for joining us today. Uh, you are all now demuted and go right ahead. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> <laughs> awesome guys thank you guys so so much <laughs> check, check for that email in a minute uh so just check for that a lot of great resources videos you can check in online watch those videos type in some uh what your favorite one is and learn even more thank you so so much for joining us today carolyn it was fantastic